some of the world's leading concert performers have been on the stage of this theatre in Sydney, but the venue is known to only a handful of the city's theatre-goers. There's no other theatre quite like it anywhere in Australia, and there probably never will be. On this occasion, the performers were Beryl Potter and Ladislav Jacek. The concert was in aid of the Australian Elizabethan Theatre Trust. As on all occasions at this theatre, the audience obtained their tickets privately because it's not a public theatre and it's not a commercial operation. If money is made, it's for the organisations behind the performers. Each year, the Australian Elizabethan Theatre Trust holds several concerts here, and so do many other cultural, ethnic and musical organisations. The theatre was built by the late Mr Vivian Chalwan, a millionaire businessman, sportsman and philanthropist. He designed it himself and even helped build it. For interior decoration, he drew on his personal experiences and impressions of the great old theatres of Europe. He created a scaled-down version of one that reflected the graciousness of the 18th century through its Georgian neoclassical interior. If this was a public theatre in the centre of Sydney, it would be unusual enough. But what makes it really distinctive is that Vivian Chalwin built it as part of his house in the harbourside suburb of Cremorn. Admittedly, it's no ordinary house. Vivian Chalwin built a castle. For the neighbours and other harbourside dwellers, the astonishing development of Chalvin Castle over the years has been a source of wonder and speculation. Vivian Chalvin once told a reporter, when it's finished, it will go down as one of the great buildings of the world. It is without question quite extraordinary. A Medici prince from 18th century Florence would feel at home here. The three-storied brick residence that was on the site when Mr. Chalwin began building the castle in 1951 is still there, inside the castle. It was swallowed up in a 30-year-long program of renovation and construction that never stopped until Mr. Chalwin died in 1980. Stone lions of Florence guard the arched iron-grilled portico and turrets and towers punctuate the skyline. There are no lawns or conventional gardens at the castle. Chalwin migrated from England to Australia after World War II, he brought his chauffeur with him. Now retired, the driver lives at the castle in a turret-top building. He's one of several men who spent the best part of their working life beside Mr. Chalwin building the castle and its diverse facilities. The noted musician Yehudi Menuhin once said to the castle's owner, Vivian, you should have been a prince of the Medici. Vivian Chalwin's background, however, was much humbler. His parents were small shopkeepers in Surrey. After an engineering apprenticeship, he worked his way up from the factory floor to the boardroom of a big engineering company. Along the way, he became a county cricketer, professional footballer, and amateur boxing and tennis champion. He spoke French, German, Italian, Spanish, and Russian yet didn't get a university degree until 1971 as a part-time student in Sydney. He amassed a fortune in Australia through coach lines and car parks. The castle is now included in Sydney Harbour tourist cruises. There are few photographs of Vivian Chalwin, even though he gave away a fortune in support of Australian sporting and cultural groups. He got the New South Wales Ballet started by paying the wages of the entire company for the first 10 weeks. One day, on impulse, he gave $100,000 to the Australian Opera. While his generosity and patronage were widely appreciated, 
His obsession with building a castle puzzled a great many people outside the family. However, to his daughter, Mrs. Jo Thompson, the reason for building such a different home was really very simple. Well, I think that it was a challenge. He was lucky to have a large house and a spare block of land next door, so he could expand his ideas. And of course, none of it was done over one or two years. This is 30 years you're looking at. Things slowly changed, and um, he had a sort of creative feeling that he had to let go, and the house or the castle was one way of doing it. He designed things on the back of envelopes when he came home from work and did drawings of the uh, types of patteray and ceiling designs he wanted and then expected the builders to carry it out, which they did. In the end, they got to know his ideas very well. What did people think about it as it went up? Uh, I don't think they understood at first really what he was doing. They thought that perhaps uh, it was another place for the second coming of Christ, like the place at Balmoral. But as everybody started to travel, go overseas, they saw that there were many places that were built like this and people did do f different things from the normal. Dad used to joke and called it Chowan's Folly and found that quite amusing, but he still went on building. What was it like living here? Really no different. I suppose we always lived here. I couldn't say that it was any different to anywhere else because I've never had an experience living anywhere else. Always very interesting. My sister and I had uh, wonderful times, really, when you look back at meeting various sporting and musical people. Uh, it was never dull, and uh, we were expected to do our share of clearing up and tidying up, but also you had the compensation of different things going on at weekends. It would seem that the builders were always here. Yes. They watched us grow up from small girls to now, and are part of the family almost. We only have Bill left with us now, but... Uh, he seems to go on forever and not want to retire. I don't know what we'd do without him. The men who worked on the castle found it a fascinating experience, but none expected the job to last as long as it did. Bill Davidson is the last of them. Bill, how did you get involved with Mr. Chowan? Well, I went and done a job in the office for him, and they uh, said to come out here and uh, do some work on his place. Did you expect to stay this long? Well, not this long. But as we start to build on to it, it got more involved in it and kept on going and going. So we ended up at the castle. How much paint do you use a year? Oh, about as much as I use my Arbor Bridge. Did you have any uh, contribution in the uh, design work on it? Oh, no, I just suggest things now and again. The boss had all the brains on that. You know, he'd seen a lot of castles overseas and he thought he'd uh, try and ease hand at it. And uh, this is how it ended up. Pretty good job we've done on it, considering. And uh, it's a pity he died, otherwise it would have went on more. They'll be building that theatre underneath, but I don't know if they're going to finish it or not. And uh, we nearly got everything completed before he died. Vivian Chalwin's patronage of the arts did not end with his death. He arranged for his masterpiece, the theatre, to become a permanent rent-free venue for performers. It's a touch worthy of the Medici. We had a ballroom in the old house, a large one, and we used to have parties and charity um, fundraising there. And when Parling closed their small theatre in George Street, he had the idea that perhaps there was a need for a small auditorium where um, you didn't have an enormous audience, but you had enough people to appreciate the players. He felt that it was necessary for young people in particular to have somewhere where they could perform in a sympathetic situation. He uh, didn't really uh, feel it necessary to sound his own trumpet at all. He didn't have the need for public acclaim or praise at all. And he had this strive to achieve things, that you just didn't sit around and do nothing, you had to achieve something in your lifetime, and I guess by looking at this place now, you can see that he probably did succeed in achieving something a little bit more than anybody else would do in their lifetime. Mm -hmm.